and just I'm thankful to her in general. This could not have happened without her. And she's very modest, y'all. Now, we're in the essence of time, and I know people like to eat. <laughs> and so, what we're going to do is, James, um, I'm going to introduce the family quickly. James has to catch uh, James Connors, who's a childhood friend from our neighborhood, and we want to have him have a few minutes. But we really, the family, my children, they want to speak on their father, and I want to tell some stories. <laughs> Because, you know, we didn't just arrive here or arrive in Northwestern. We were on a journey. So, if you bear with us and come back in, we'll, we'll do the stories I forgot. I didn't know it was going to be um, video, but it's okay. Um, so, we're going to start with um, James's sisters, Rosalind, Rosalind Cree, which she may have. Harriet once told us, told James when he was 30, she said, she asked him how old he was. <laughs> she, he said 30. She said, oh, you're old. <laughs> I'm so proud of what my brother has done over the years. And all of you guys that he has helped, you know, on your life journey. I'm, I'm just so proud of him. James, I love you. Same birthday with Melvin. Yes. <laughs> Dolores Johnson. Our nephew, Kenyatta. We helped you. You say we helped you, but we, the journey that we was on, and with so many people who helped us, is how we are here today. So if you bear with us and after we eat, we'll tell you a little bit about that. It was a journey. So um, James Connors is also a childhood friend from our neighborhood. Lafayette. I'm one of the uh, people who had the unique experience of growing up with the Turners. You know, and I really regret that my real, I'm almost in tears myself, my really close friend, Lorraine Turner, is not here today. That was my buddy, and we did a lot together, so uh, I'm really regretting it, as well as Stevie, you know, and of course, Harry was in my class in school, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And so I've often heard James call himself, well, well, first let me tell you, we are from the Low East Side. Some people call it the East Village, uh, precisely Avenue D, but we call it the Avenue. And we still call it the Avenue. 
and James and I sometimes driving in my car going someplace, or I've even heard him say in a lecture, he calls himself a deep boy. And following him, so do I. So before I run, let me just say this. Listening to the other panelists on both panels earlier, it took me back to some of my writings, uh, and I have not yet published my book on this. I should have done it 20 years ago. I never did. But I followed Hollis Lynch in studying Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden, who's probably the greatest Pan-Africanist of the 19th century. And one of the things that Blyden said was that your place in the universe was a your place in the universe was assigned to you as Africans, and there's no place for you as anything else. And I think James Turner best exemplifies that. He taught us what it means to be African. He lets us know what our place is, and he does it with clear, clear African-centric critical analysis and interpretation. It's not enough just to know your history. You have to know how to interpret it from an African-centric point of view. And that's James Turner. So, Brother James, I just want to let you know I just want to let you know what you mean to me. I love you, brother, and what the entire Turner family meant to me. Because it was the image of James Turner when I was running the streets and doing a whole lot of bad stuff. It wasn't even Dr. Clark, who I was close to. Because me, Stevie, and I had some conversations. Listen, you need to, you know, look at my brother James. It was James Turner and people like James Turner that turned my life around. All right, and that's how I got here today. And I'm just trying to do follow him and do my little bit. All right, I got into it rather late because I was running the streets, but I'm trying to follow James and do my little bit. And James, I want you to, to know that I'm always here. For, you already know what I said. I'm always there for the Turner family, and you mean so much to me. You call me anytime. I'm there for you. You know that, James. Always. So thank you so much, Madasi Asante Sana.
Yeah, hold it, hold it. If you hold it in front of your mouth, it's better. Those were the, um, the projects were all the way almost to City Hall. I was, my family went into what we called the Balladics. James's family went into Hillier Wall. And we met as young teens. I was supposed to be his friend's little girlfriend. <laughs> However, I couldn't go out, but James would come up and stand in the hallway of my window and talk for hours. <laughs> And then his friend would come up on a Saturday <laughs> with him. But, um, so we lost track, we were young teens, we lost track about four or five years. And James' leadership started with the junior sportsman, <laughs> where he was called Reno. <laughs> and um, he started his leadership skills being chairman of the, of the of group. But most of our support came from our families. His parents and my, my parents. <coughs> my mother always wouldn't let us say Negro. They were from the South. She was from the South. And she said, no, we're black. So I'm saying, well, nobody else says that. But she said, that's what it is. And fast forward, James and I meet up again. Uh, he graduates from high school, I'm a senior in high school. So, but um, he was a player. was the Paris priest, and he hired the social worker, uh, Dr. Shirley Jones, and her husband, Sandy Jones, who looked out for us. One Sunday night, after we hadn't seen, we hadn't seen each other for about four or five years, his four handsome gentlemen came into the dance, to our party, to the dance, the church dance. And my girlfriends, everybody was looking, they were dressed to the nines. <laughs> so anyway, he says, uh, so we, Dance a little bit. He didn't dance that way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he tried. He tried. So, uh, his, uh, so my girlfriend said, you take so-and-so, and I'll take so-and-so, and the other one to take him, and the other person to take James. So the, one of our friends said, she said, no, you can't take so-and-so because we've been going together. <laughs> but we didn't, I didn't tell you. <laughs> so anyway. They wanted to go back, she wanted to go back. The other friend said, well, I'll take him. He said, too late. You don't have somebody else. <laughs> but uh, that evening, uh, I'll just say, he said, um, can I walk you home? I said, sure. We got to the door. He wasn't there, so I was halfway home. He <laughs> brought up with his friend. He had a friend named Wilbur. Remember Wilbur? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wilbur was in the service. <laughs> he went to his house, changed his clothes, and come to the dance. So anyway, he catches up with me. He says, how come you've been waiting? I said, I'm waiting for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, he was on time from then on. He going to tell me tonight. I don't remember that. <laughs> Father Myers and Shirley Jones is the ones that introduced us and encouraged us to go on to college and to work in the community and be supportive. James then took a job with the city youth board, working with young men who were uh, former gang members and stuff. So he was aware, he understood gang members since it was the Judy Sportsman Club. But um, he was aware it was, and Father Myers noticed his, the intellectual and leadership of James. And my friend's mother, said, well, you know, he's dating Janice, so we better check and see 
who he is and, and what he's doing at the bottom. So anyway, Paul and I had him come up, and then he went to work. They gave us opportunities. I was sent to Mexico. James was sent out to California for an internship. And then um, we decided to get married. But we was talking, oh, before we do that, James also um, went, we went up to hear Malcolm all and to keep him the rest of the And he would, um, he would go to the Michelle bookstore, and there was another person, um, Richard E. Moore. And James and my mother always talked politics, racial stuff, and segregate, all of that. So he invited us to go. Richard Moore would have these Sunday meetings. And he had this little book called The Name Negro. And it's, um, it's uh, Origins of Music. And my mom would go all the time, and he would fight go, James would She would go with James. So anyway, when he was getting married, getting the same talk and getting married, he said, well, Mom, uh, Janice doesn't want to uh, iron my shirt or cook a certain dish. <laughs> I won't say this. And I said, well, I'm not. And my mother said, oh, yes, she will. <laughs> so I said, well, then you need to marry him. <laughs> I did, after we got married, I did try one day to do these shirts. James had about 30 shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it took me all day, and I said, I can't do this. <laughs> so they had to go to the laundry bed. So then one evening, he came home to work and was saying, well, you know, we got into those bags. He said, well, I'll just take my shirts to my mother. I said, okay. <laughs> and he came home the next day. They were in a bag by the door. <laughs> but then he took them back to the so, but uh, these were some of the things how we got to go where we were. And I was in school, and I, I just missed the one semester having this young man over here. And uh, but I went back to school, and, and James's mother would take care of him for a day and overnight because we were in a special program where you could go in the afternoon to City College and in the evening. And backtracking that with Dr. Shirley Jones, who told us about this program because when we applied for college, the, the um, counselors didn't, didn't tell us anything. And we only applied, we applied to Hunter, which was very exclusive. And so only one of my friends got in, and then they pulled a fast one on her. And I, I got into Howard, but it was $1,000. That was like a million dollars. I didn't have coffee to get to school. We walked. So, but back that summer, Shirley Jones, Dr. Shirley Jones, said, found out about City Colleges program and that we could get in and it was, would be $12 a credit. We'd have to matriculate after a year and then we could go free. So I said, okay, we'll go. My friend Charlene had taken a job and I called and told her she quit the job and went on to school there. We worked for a year or so, and James wanted to go to college, wanted to go. So I said, I don't know how we can go. I'm not quitting, and so how somebody has to work. So anyway, he started applying to Frank Lovejoy's Guide to Colleges and Universities for Married Housing, and found a um, school in Mich Central Michigan, a school in California, uh, Chico State, which was, I'm glad we didn't go there. <laughs> And um, the following year, when our son was nine months old, our parents did not want us to go. They were upset, particularly James's family, because uh, Hassan was the first grandson there. But um, my mother had a, uh, I had a niece, so there were two grandchildren. But she still thought, well, fine, if that's what you're going to do. And so we left New York, gave up the apartment, gave away everything. We had a record player. A stroller, the baby, and, and some suitcases, and went to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, on two planes and a bus. When we got there, um, this man took pity on us. He was meeting someone else, so he gave us a ride to the housing. And James went up to get the key from the person, and the lady liked to have a fit. <laughs> she she was so shocked. And then the next morning, there was all this buzzing 
because we didn't know we were the only African American couple mm -hmm. on campus and in the town. Wow. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, fast forward, we, it's 9,000 students. Things happened. We all got together. It was 40 blacks from the continent and from the U.S. And one of the darkest days was when our friend James came from, um, he came from Grand Rapids. And uh, the length of that, before we left, we went to dinner at um, uh, the mosque and met Malcolm. And Malcolm came over to us. He said, you look like brother and sister, but you look too, cl you're too close for that. <laughs> so we told him where we were going. And he sent up, and they went, got maps, showed us. He gave us uh, uh, his family, Grand Rapids, addresses and things. And then he and James started to correspond. But the one day, our, another friend, James, came banging on our door. And we said, oh gosh, what happened now? And he was crying. And he said, Malcolm was, was killed. And here we are in the middle of nowhere. With, we didn't have a telephone. And so anyway, word got around to the black students and they came to our apartment. And James sat and we talked with them and, and we talked half the night about it. So it was really sad that we were not near it, but we had family. The students were our family. So, um, and just a little more about that, my brother came to live with us. And um, James tutored and instructed him on the political scenes and everything. And, um, then we, uh, before we left, an incident, uh, I was supposed to student teach. And when we got back at Christ after Christmas, the supervisor said that the school in Mount Pleasant wasn't going to allow me because I was African American as well. So I'm saying I have eight weeks left of school. What am I going to do? And James was already in classes. So anyway, he called his mom. And his mom said, we're going. By that time, we had succumbed to So we took him to New York. That was a very hard thing, but they took really good care of him. His sisters, and um, they took care of him. Remember those days? I do remember those days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So as a, what I'm trying to say is that where so many people were helping us, okay? Because even when um, we were having, when I was having Sakai, the students would come by and sit with me um, just to see if something happened, they would go to get James. And so they sent my brother to get the police to get James out of class. So that was another thing. Sakai was the first African American baby born in the house, but we didn't know that. So, I mean, there were other, um, there were Native Americans there, but they had their children on the reservation. So, so it was, you know, we were there for three years. So then after that, James had one more year. We did it. James did it in Southern Red in three years. And I said, well, I have another year. I'll do a master's. Got to the last semester, we ran out of money. And so I was talking to my friend Charlene. And I said, well, I'm not going to be able to go. And she said, yes, you are. And she sent me the money. She sent me the money. You remember? Yeah. So these are the kinds of things. And then James was going to Northwestern. Um, we didn't have a car. The students, two of the students negotiated with someone else to give us to get for us to buy a car. My dad came up and drove with us. And that's how we got to Evanston and Northwestern. And then I was on the third job. <laughs> so but um, then there at graduate school, that's when you got John Bracy and Sonyara and a whole bunch of people that would come and um, just support us and help us. And then we, Hassan, we put him in Head Start. <laughs> That's when we met the community. And a very good friend, Mrs. Henry, and Mr. Henry and he had 12 children. But you never knew, you didn't know how, who were their children because when feeding time came, half the neighborhood came into the <laughs> so, you know, But they were, they were really good. But John and them talked about the Northwestern things. And um, so I won't go into that, except for that the community there really supported us. We even had Sam and Javis come, and all he wanted was a dinner, because James, they were raising funds for the, for the students. So then we stayed, we left, we were leaving, coming to Ithaca. And I said, 
do you really have to go there? <laughs> because at first I thought in New York, I said, okay, you know, we'll get back to the family. Although we had good family families there. So coming back, we uh, came, moved here, and brought uh, about four young people <coughs> to go to Ithaca College and Cornell. And then our brothers, our brothers came. One in graduate school, one at Ithaca College, and my brother at undergraduate school. So that, that was our family. We, stayed, we always had family to help us and support us. And then I met a nice young woman named Doris Johnson, whose birthday was the same as Malcolm's. And James had told me that everybody, the, you know, the mothers and children were coming over to our house for a barbecue. And I'm going around and we don't even have any food. <laughs> How do we do this? So Dolores came with a friend and then introduced us and the children to other families and things. And that's how um, we got here. But then Africana, I took the call, that was the other part, I took the call from the police. And they said that um, the building had burned down. And I said, it was April 1st. I said, is this an April 1st show? And he said, no ma'am. So I got James up, my brother, and they, they went down and like that. It was, because it was really frightening because some of the faculty would stay there and they would be working there. And some had offices up and, you know, up there. So they would have never got it. They would have never got it. So that was a very sad thing. And then as um, we had the police escort, and as my children thought, they thought they were, they were as someone said, VIP. <laughs> but it was Africana who made a home for my children myself. Um, we have a picture of um, my younger son in his slippers, sitting on the steps at the old, uh, the old um, building. But they would come in and out of here, and um, we had a school bus would drop them off if I was working or I was doing something. So this is what Africa and all the students, the <coughs> students, they did stuff for us. And um, Dalton Jones and his graduate students did a program down at Southside that our son was. Um, at the nursery school with Mrs. Viola Scott. <laughs> and they taught those young four-year-olds, five-year-olds math on a tape recorder. Now we have all these other things, but it was a tape. They taped their lessons. Mm -hmm. And so the children, at certain times, Mrs. Scott would have them go and listen to the lesson that they needed to do, and they did. So I know I've jumped around, but I just want all of you to know how we appreciate doing this for James and our family. But we didn't get here alone, and we're still not alone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. But, um And the reason that I wanted to speak, because initially I wasn't going to say anything, but after being here for the past two days, and you know, when I got back to the, ho the hotel at night, there were a lot of things that ju just kept flooding my mind. And the things that came are tied to something that my brother said to me when I was 19. And it has stayed with me all these years. And so when these thoughts came, and I have to tell you, let me just say this. What I will say is from a different, from a different perspective of what you guys have heard this week. But I will share it because it is deeply tied to something that he said to me. <laughs> so part of it I'm going to read, a part of it I'll probably talk about. Um, I will read most of it because, as I said, I was not planning to say anything. And when Janice asked me about a month ago, my first reaction was, oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm just not going to say anything. So I'm going to begin. As many of you know, Dr. Turner is one of eight children. Uh, there were four boys and four girls, and four of us remain. We have a brother who was not able to be here today because of some health challenges, and we have our sister, Harriet, who is here. Um, and I said to you when Janice told me I didn't want to say anything. And the reason that I said no to her, 
initially was because I couldn't think of what I wanted to talk to be talking about. James is a few years older than me, and in growing up, I just couldn't remember. I really could not remember, other than the statement that he said to me. So, um, it was my 19th birthday, and I can tell you guys that I remember this as clearly as on the it was just happening. We were in the project apartment, like my sister in law said. We were in the third bedroom. No, no, I'm sorry. In the middle bedroom, James. Um, it was a beautiful sunny day. I remember what I was wearing, but I don't remember why we had the conversation, what he, why he said this to me, or what was said after. But what he said to me is that we are made in the image of God. And for all of these years, that part of that conversation has remained with me. And from time to time, I've thought about it. And, you know, I said, well, what are you talking about? Why did you say that? And I still can't remember. But I will tell you this, that the Bible says, yeah. okay, the Bible tells us that all that is in God is in us. So what the Bible says when you read through it is that we have the same genetic makeup as God. That we have that DNA in us. And I have come to understand that and believe that. And it is tied back again to what my brother said. Um, if you look in the Bible at Isaiah 9, 6, it says, that God is a counselor, he's a father, he's mighty, and he is the prince of peace. And I know that there are so many other attributes that we can use to describe him. But when I was sleeping and I kept waking up at night, these were the things that came to mind. And I know that in my walk of faith, I know that these things are true. So in, in thinking and reflecting and, you know, knowing the Bible and reading a lot, the Bible says that he is a good God. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. He is merciful. He is forgiving. He is kind. He is patient. He is all of this and so much more. And he is a loving father and a friend. It says that he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And so when I thought about it, and really, quite frankly, again, I wasn't thinking about, oh, well, I'm going to talk about James in this, from this point. But it just kept flooding my mind the past few months. And so, and it also says that he is faithful when we lose faith, that he remains faithful to us. And so when I thought about James, and it's, it just kept coming up, and I ran and typed this this morning, so um, I was thinking about that, that the Father God is faithful when we lose faith. And when I've heard so many of you talk about him this week and say that in all of those struggles, he didn't give up, you know, he didn't lose faith, that he found a way to say, well, we can get through this. And so, let me see. And the most important thing I want to say is that when we think of a spiritual father, when we think of God, he always loves us through no matter what we go through. And so, to James, I want to say, can I just let me go? Thank you. You exemplify all of this and you represent the very best in each of your siblings. You have remained faithful to this cause and to what you believe, and you have done it with such integrity and grace. So I say this, when Janice talked about our families and how our parents helped us, that when we honor James as his siblings, his wife, our, his extended family, Charlene, our nieces, when we honor you, James, we honor our parents who taught us 
Brianna and her father both did work three jobs to support us. All right, now. He worked and he taught us the dignity of work. Yes. We honor our mother who yes. taught us to do our best, to never give up, and to always square our shoulders and hold our head high. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that. And when, you know, as I said, the past two nights, those kind of things came to me. And I said, well, I don't know, maybe I will, maybe I will. But finally, I think I was just strongly impressed by the Spirit of God to do this. And so I want to say on behalf of all of our family, those that are gone and those that remain, that we are deeply appreciative of all of you that have come out and have shown this love and compassion and care for Dr. Turner. And we thank all of you for taking the time, the energy, and the care to come and be a part of this celebration. To Janice, I couldn't have a better sister and I think. James, a lot of my girlfriends, my folks' girlfriends, know about you. And they know that I'm honored to be your sister. And for this, and for all that he has done, and for all the lives that he has touched, I say to God be the Lord. And I thank you. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> this has been overwhelming. Someone said to me, who's this man? I said, it's my dad. <laughs> hey, Pop. Um, like Mom said, like Aunt Rodney said, everything that we are comes from our family. Um, we were very fortunate to have both of our grandparents with us through most of our life. Um, we got a thrill going down to the city after living. Um, being able to have them you know, in our life. Um, so for us, it was kind of exciting because we we grew up in New Ithaca. We were like, what are you doing for the summer? We're going down to New York. So I don't often tell people I'm from New York. Well, I was born in New York City. So that was an important part of our upbringing. Um, but, but more importantly, um, when I think about what we experienced here, um, really one word comes to mind, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks, it's huge amount. And, and I had to go through the definition and, I, and it just it said everything that, 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 that epitomizes our family, our extended family, um, cooperative living, um, extended family, uh, the cooperation that we have within each other's lives and, 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 and how we work towards a common goal. Um, Ujima was an important part of my upbringing because that's where I used to hang out as a kid. I'd run through there, I'd run through the rooms. Students would like welcome me. Oh, hey, Dr. Turner's son's here. So, you know, these kinds of things are so important to me. So, I heard today that folks were thanking us for the time that Dad gave us. Um, he gave it right back to us. We, we, weren't, we weren't efficient. Um, there was so much. And, and the gaps that there may have been were filled by most of you in this room and a lot that were that would like to have been here and not here. Um, so we had a full life of, of everybody. So my, one of my biggest things at night was watching from my dad coming across, I guess, the field over here, coming back from work as he would go through the field and up through the trail. So I'd be sitting outside waiting for him to come home, uh, you know, when I wasn't in trouble. <laughs> you know, no, 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 he wasn't coming home. But, uh, but, uh, but to that point, we were never deficient. Um, didn't matter what we were doing. Homework, he was there great now homework. And, 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 and let me be honest, the, the, the critique and the detail, the level of detail that they both gave us, unbelievable. So there was a lot of work they were doing outside of the house, but we had everything we needed um, and, and, and more. Um, and I have to say, because of all that we've done in terms of growing up and experience, and, and no disrespect to all the intellectual talent passion that was in that founding group of uh, professors and uh, teachers and, and, and students. This wouldn't have happened without mom. I'm just saying.
put it together. We were always there at school. Um, my goodness. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to call your mother. I said, we really don't do that. <laughs> and it seemed like it was before she hung up. You know, the floor, she was coming up, up, up the walkway. And I'm like, this is really not good. <laughs> but again, what that said to the community was that she was there. She was involved. And her and dad were involved. Dad would come up to the school and talk about history the way it should be talked about. Um, and I'm sitting there going, wow, this is not going to be cool. <laughs> but of course, at the end of the day, everybody's like, wow, that was awesome. So yeah, we experienced a lot. Our first, our first day, I remember, I don't know about my sister and brother, but we pulled up to our house right up here on Pleasant Grove, and we had a you know, visit from the local police. They thought someone had broken into the house. I'm like, we just drove all this way from Edmonton, and this is what we've got. So that began it. And of course, the, the, the officers that were securing our home after the fire, drive walking us down the drive, uh, following us down the driveway, and meeting us when we got back from school. I'm not really sure we understood the breadth or the depth of all of that. Um, and maybe we shouldn't have at that age. Um, but I know the community that was Africana um, kept us protected and made sure we were all right. There was, you know, endless number of people who were coming in and out, supporting our, supporting our family and supporting our community. So for that, you know, I'm, I'm always grateful. Um, and I never forget, I mean, my first job um, was from um, a student that was in our home, uh, working, you know, came over, dad always had, had, you know, people over, students over in our living room. You know, and I did my thing, you know, running around. She comes in, I'm in I just graduated from college. Um, and here she comes in, she's looking at me. This is my boss's fiance. And she comes out, she says, I remember when you were this small. I said, I'm, I'm Maudine Nelson, um, who was here, I guess, in 71, 72, um, in our home. And here I am now connected to them. And those connections continue to happen. It's unbelievable. I can go anywhere. I can't go anywhere without someone coming up and saying something to me about mom and dad. And, and the experience that, they, that, you know, that they've had. So I'll tell you one quick story. I was down in the Caribbean once, and I wasn't supposed to be there. And of course, it turns out that there was somebody down there from Cornell. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I go back to school, and um, mom and dad don't say anything. I get back home for Thanksgiving. So, so I was in Bahamas. <laughs> so, it's all love. I mean, she, that woman at that time was looking out for me. I knew it was going to go back, but I, had, I, I didn't have the heart or the guts to go tell them where I was. I think it was my last year of college, so we were having a little bit of fun. <laughs> so I just had a few things uh, I wanted to share because um, as a teacher, I bring a lot of this into the classroom, into our school. So I'm in a school in, in the Bronx that's a lot of wealthy people, uh, a lot of people that don't look like us. Um, and I often talk about the to the kids how important education is and how important not just to be successful in life, but to be able to reach back and help uh, others in, in, in their community. And I came up with a couple of things. Um, this whole 50 years, what it meant, and, and how I could cap capitalize it into a couple of words. So it's the experience within the experience. So I think for students, the first experience is Cornell. Wow, this is awesome. But then the real experience was Africa. Right? That, in, in fact, helped develop and shape their life. So I came up with a, I was looking for quotes, but I, this is a very obscure quote um, that I came up with. Uh, I hope I didn't lose it. Oh, here it is. Nice. And um, it, it comes from a woman who developed a school, one of those well-heeled schools in, in Manhattan on the east side. But I, I took it because Dad would always go to the school uh, uh, in February for Black History Month. Um, it was the Dalton School. And he had met there, I think it was maybe a, a, a lump from Cornell, um, and kept inviting Dad up. So, in part, it said, as she referenced Dalton, it is culture achieved through individual development and through collective cooperation. It's no longer school, it's life. So I always tell kids that you don't go to school to prepare you for life. School's got to be in you, right? It's got to be part of your life. And I always felt that Cornell was that, that school where I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a great job. And for some, it did happen that way. But for a lot of us, there had to be another experience uh, in order to prepare us for the life that we were going to have. And I think for me, even though I was here watching all of you kind of go through your, your maturation and your development, um, 
it resonated with me as I went through my life at, at that same point, that we've got to be able to think about, you know, the next steps in our life. And that's why I tell the kids now that I teach. Some are kids of alum here, which is unbelievable. It just blows my mind when they come up to me and I'm like, my mom said that your father was my best teacher. <laughs> You know, and I've met them all, and, and you know, we, I hear the stories, but here I'm now teaching their kids. Um, but I tell them the same thing, I And I continue to tell them. One kid said to me, Mr. Turner, why, why are you always, oh God, you know, you're always honest, you're always telling. I said, I said, but how am I doing? I said, well, you are, you are, you're always smiling. I said, yeah, and what do I say? I just love you, because I do. And, and I told them, the day that someone stops telling you what's wrong with what you're doing, or stops advising you on the right way to go, you need to be concerned. Mm -hmm. All right, because it's not okay just because they haven't done it. You know what I'm it's not okay. So it's part, it's part of my responsibility, and it's going to be also a bigger part of your responsibility to make sure you do the right thing. So those are the things that I've, I've, I've learned over the time, and um, and the last thing, you know, what what I what I admire most about faculty, about all the mentors that we've had, my dad, my mom, is that they had a body of knowledge and experience that was probably not matched by anybody um, that I've ever come, to, ever come across. But what was more important was their gift of giving it back. Because I think the other day I was telling our we were in church and, and, and I heard this about having knowledge or having the ability to do something and not sharing it. Right. Mm -hmm. How can you be good at that? if you're not giving it back. So when I hear and I see in the brochure of all these students with these PhDs and, and, and high accomplishments at different schools across the country and their experiences throughout the continent, um, that's what it comes down for me, is that this information was given back and given back without any strings attached, you know, <coughs> other than pay it forward. Right. Yes. Give it back to the community in some way, shape, or form. And that's what I remember about that. Uh, and being in the office sometime with him, Professor Naji, across the hall with the music going, you know, all night. So that was, and sometimes I would sneak out the house because Dad wasn't home yet, and I'd come rolling through the thing, okay, Dad, yeah, they're there. You know, or sometimes I would just come in, you know, because he actually sometimes knew I was there. You know, there was no way of hiding anything from him at that point. But um, it was always fascinating for me to be in the company of, um, of our elders. Um, and didn't know exactly the impact that it would have. But um, I do show you now, and uh, when I look at my dad and my mom, and, you know, it's 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 hard to, well, at least after today, you know, I, I, I look at them even more differently than I have. I mean, but there's reverence and there's respect and there's love um, each and every day. And, you know, and as we all get older, you know, I just try to remember all the things that they did to enrich our lives. And when I hear from you all, I, I know they did the same for you. So thank you so much. <laughs> Exactly. And so they were very creative. So I, I had to pull some things out. 
some of my boxes today, you're going to laugh because we haven't talked about these things in a while, but one of the things that was important when we were growing up was the kinds of books that we, we got. So mom and dad, when they traveled, always came home with books, right? Not just any old books, but I always wanted the kinds of books that would give me an eye view about what it's like to grow up as a black girl. And so this is one of my first and favorite books and one of my earliest. So this is what I was looking for the other day, Mom. What Mary Jo shared. Just a little book about a little girl who was shy. And um, the teacher tells her one day, all right, everybody's going to bring something to show and tell. So get thinking about it. So her dad every day would say, so Mary Jo, have you thought about what you're going to share? And she couldn't think of anything. Everybody else had an idea but her. So on this day, uh, the other children came to school and they brought their spiders and their rockets and their rocks and their cards. And she still couldn't figure out what to bring to share. So the story ends, Mary Jo's idea was to bring her dad to school. So I was thinking, we didn't really have show and tell, at least I didn't volunteer for show and tell at school. I just wasn't into it. But I didn't really need to have show and tell in order for dad to come to school, because I was right, mom and dad were at school a lot. <laughs> and I thought it was a big treat. I remember one time hearing that they were in school, but they didn't call us out of the office so that we could see them. But they were in school for us, not only to find, basically to make sure we were doing fine, to make sure the teachers were doing well by us, but it wasn't just the three of us. They came to school to check on the other kids, who also were having some difficulty, or maybe no one was speaking up about them. It's one classmate of mine. He was in a classroom across the hallway, and there was a door there, whereas everyone else had an open classroom. His classroom was just a door. You couldn't see into it. And they only let him out. Uh, they let him into our fifth grade class for math. And every time he came into the room, the teacher had a problem with him. And I couldn't understand how a teacher, who we were, we were raised to respect, didn't like this little boy and wouldn't give him a chance to learn. And so he'd come in, and then within minutes, they'd be in altercation. And when I saw it, I ran to the office and I told. Because I said something right here. And then I got on the phone and I called mom. I said, Mom, you gotta get here. He's in trouble. And so they went to school for us, but also for the other kids who weren't being treated well. So anyway, these were a lot of the kinds of books that um, I had growing up. And then I also found, Dad, this is gonna make you laugh too. So um, so I was at ASNRC 290, Sociology of the Black Experience. I was a high school student who didn't get college credit, but I wasn't treated like any, I wasn't treated any differently than anybody else. So this was dad's class. Mom and dad hatched this plan. So I found one of my own old exam books. And so it turns out I was 16 and thought it was a good idea actually, for other reasons. And the exam was on my birthday, the first exam. And I guess I was so nervous when it said date of examination, I put my actual birth year instead of the year that it was. But one of the things I remember about being in class with Dad was that um, he didn't make you have to flip back to the end to find the grade. The grades are on the front. And then, I don't know if that was purposeful or not, but you saw your grade, and then he would encourage you to go back and look for the comments. And there are comments in here. So if I got a B plus, I needed to know why I got a B plus. So there's things in the margin where he's saying, good. Then it says, well, you actually left out this or that, and there's a very long passage here. So I said, okay. But that was also very, very um, helpful to me. I'll get back to that in a second. And then I want to talk to you about, too, what was creative about the way we grew up was music. There was music in our house all the time. From the moment Dad got home until, you know, wee hours of the morning, and we'd turn it, off, turn it off to me so we could go to sleep. On the weekends, the music came again. So. He was really into jazz, and then there was also um, uh, reggae and R&B. And I remember Joe Sample was one of my favorite artists, and we played it over and over and over again. But the music was very helpful to us. It was not only a way to calm, um, help us calm and study, but also it turned into other opportunities too. So I remember applying to um, Night Sounds. It was in the competition, and I got. I want a, I want a, uh, a guest spot with Annette Larrier because I can answer some questions about jazz. And then later when I went to Spelman, I wanted somehow I wanted to work at the Clark, uh, Clark's radio station. And there were three of us who worked the overnight shift playing jazz. Now, you know, it was short-lived because it was hard to stay up that all night playing music. But that's kind of how it happened. The music that we learned early in our lives helped 
open opportunities as well. And then, also, you got to think this is nuts too. This is my application statement to Stone. Now, I don't know why I still have this data, but I remember working on draft after draft <laughs> after draft because it just had to be right. So I, I had that and I saved it. And then later on, uh, in 2003, you um, did me the honor of having me, uh, inviting me along to, to work with you. And they were two summer institutes. This one was 2003, it was type holding up both ends of the sky. And this was really amazing. So the Summer Institute scholars included Elsa Barkley Brown, Kathleen Cleaver, Betty Collier Thomas, Carol Boyce Davies, Beverly Guy Sheftall, Joy James, Miss Sarah Mugo, Linda James Myers, Suzette Spencer, Gail T, Rosalind Turnbull Penn, Eleanor Trailer, and Marta Moreno Vega. And these were some of these people I grew up knowing, but he had me right alongside him. So in the back it says that the program director was James Turner and I was his assistant. We had amazing, we had amazing time for two whole summers. And so the summer institute fellows that, that summer included Alan Kalam, Melina Abdullah, Carol Arnold, Alyssa Braithwaite, Vinnie Burroughs, Janice Hamlet, uh, Sandra Lewis, Hadia Rashid, Stephanie Wright, and the list goes on. But this was an amazing opportunity, both for, for senior faculty, but also for, for the, the, the junior faculty who were coming through. And it was, a, it was good for me too, right? Because this was something I was learning to do. And uh, you trusted me to take care of business, and we got through. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, a few experiences, because as you know, when I was coming up in high school, or even junior high school, I decided that I wanted to study psychology. And the plan was that I would not only study psychology, but I would go to graduate school. So I want to refer directly to when I finished graduate school and I went to the University of Pittsburgh. So this, was, this, this decision was made because, one, it was good to have, it was good feedback to get offered a job straightly, shortly after I finished my graduate work, but it was also because Jerome Taylor was there in Africana Studies. And Professor Taylor um, was someone I met in the last year of my graduate study. He was a visiting faculty member at the University of Maryland Afro-American Studies. And he was there to teach a class and do some research. And I remember when I saw the flyer that he was coming, I got on the phone and I called him. I said, Dad, do you know this guy named Professor Jerome Taylor? And you're like, yeah, he's in Africana Studies at Pittsburgh. And you started to run down his credits and the things he was doing. And you talked about how he was so important within the Hill District community and the work he was doing with children and families. And he'd been at the university as long as you've been here. And you said to me, well, you need to write him. You could let him know that you're there and that you'd be very honored to meet him and that you'll see him in class. This was an undergraduate class. I wasn't, my classes were over. I really wasn't trying to go to class again. But I did want to meet Professor Taylor. And then I remember I looked up some of his research and there was this article he'd done with some graduate students. And it was titled, uh, The Self-Esteem of Children with and Without African Names. I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so I remember I, I pulled it up and I read it and I said, wow. So it was a very, very, you know, slight difference in terms of the self-esteem. But it said something to me, too, because we'd grown up in Ithaca all that time, going through the public school system here, and people really had a hard time with our names, and so I kind of couldn't understand what the big deal was. I remember, because um, I was Turner at the T, every time the teacher would get to my name, there'd be this silence. And I thought, oh, jeez, here we go. I mean, I was in second and third grade, and she could not, these teachers would have such a hard time pronouncing our, my name. And I sit there, and then they say, what can we call you for short? No. And then I come home and I say, my. What, what can they call me for sure? She says, well, you don't have a middle name. So the guy's going to have to do it. It's just five letters. What's the name? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sure that, I mean, so anyway, so if, you know, you all encourage us at home. If you have great names, these are important names. We make sure we do the meaning of those names. We met people who celebrated us because of our names. Um, so why bother? So when I read that article, I said, yeah, of course we have higher self-esteem. There's something to these names. So Dr. Taylor was instrumental in making the decision, in my decision, to go to the University of Pittsburgh. Because he was going to be in Africana Studies, I was going to be in the School of Education, where he also had a joint appointment. But one of the things that it was really important about him and his work was that he was focusing a lot, not only on black children's development, but also on black parenting. And I was really intrigued by that because I spent a lot of time hanging around you and mom and other adults, and I paid attention to parenting, how people treated kids. And I really did believe that teachers and parents and folks who have children 
both two kids write and be good read by them. But it didn't always seem to be the case. So at the University of Pittsburgh, Professor Taylor was trying to um, reach the goal of finding out what parents valued in relation to their children's outcomes. And what he would do is something very, something makes so, so, make so much sense. He would meet parents um, and he would tell them to think about their children 50 to 20 years down the road and to talk about what they wanted, how they wanted them to turn out. So he'd say, sit back, relax, and think about your child 15 to 20 years in the future. How would you like your child to feel deep down inside about herself or himself? How would you like your children to feel deep down inside about you? How would you like your child, children to feel about school? And how would you like your children to feel deep down about their peers? Now the point of the questions was to get at the aspirations that parents had for their children's development. And they fell into these particular domains, self, parents, school, and peers. The questions were presented to both black and white parents, most of whom seemed to really enjoy being asked to dream about their children's futures. And the responses of the parents of the children seemed to be categorized into these areas. Many parents talked about wanting their children to be high in learning orientation, love and respect, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-persistence, and self-reliance. So the research went on to talk about not just what parents wanted for their children, but how, what kinds of parenting behaviors were associated with these value outcomes. So Professor Taylor involved me in this research early on and allowed me to be part of um, the work in the Hill District, and we had a publication together. But as we were writing up the study, I kept thinking about how much the research reminded me of home. And so I reflected on key moments in our growth and development. It occurred to me that much of what you did, in terms of bringing us up, wasn't coincidental. It was very creative, and it was, a lot of times it was fun, but it was very intentional, it was very planful. It was little left to chance, or a kind of wait and see kind of uh, approach. You knew that there are things that we couldn't take for granted. You and mom, what they call first generation college students, right? But um, there was no guarantee that your hard work and, and would lead to just us being automatically okay. You had to work hard, and you, you encouraged us to work hard too. So I wanted to just give you a couple of examples that I took from some of that research um, as it pertains to our experience with you. So learning orientation was a big deal, right? There's no doubt about it. education. Yeah, we were going to school, we were going to work hard, we were going to do homework. Sometimes it sounds like we had double homework. We homework from school and homework from you and mom. But you know, we, we understood what that was all about. I remember um, the reason why I was in your class to begin with was that you and mom hatched this plan that I should take the class or um, as a part of sort of getting prepared for college. Now I remember you telling me about it. I remember getting off the school bus back over here and coming over to the class and walking all the way down to the hallway. But what I remember, what I thought I heard, was that I was just going to simply observe um, and kind of blend in. Well, there was a lot more to it than that. I remember coming in that class, and everyone was kind of sitting in the back of this packed. And I was looking for a seat, not in the front. And one student sort of waved me over, and it was Ruby Saki, and she said, there's a seat near me. Come sit with me. And so she was nervous that day, and I was nervous that day. And so when it was all over with, we were at dinner, and Mom said, so how was class? And I think I said something like, oh, it was fine. And you didn't say anything for a minute. And then you said, well, next week I want you to sit in the front. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. I thought I could just you know, like be anonymous. And he said, and make sure. And he said, make sure you're prepared with the readings. <laughs> so I said, well, OK. I thought I was just observing. I was just going to just be there. Well, obviously not. So in my statements for college, we wrote about how the fact that I was not treated any different. Yes, I was a high school, not in there for college credit, um, but that I was expected to do the assignments and the readings just like everybody else. But that even said to me, that's what you, you valued that. You wanted us to be good thinkers and to be savvy and sharp and to be excited about learning new things. This also sort of uh, carried forward with um, when I finished uh, Spelman and I was going to go to graduate school. I told you what I wanted to do. And you were very careful about identifying opportunities in terms of the kind of schools that would fit my interests. You um, had me repeat back a lot about what I wanted to do and why. You challenged me, asked me questions. And then you described, you, you sort of re re repeated back what I said. We had lots of long talks, all of us. And you encouraged us to also develop relationships with people. 
that we might not have thought about. So I remember when I said I wanted to go to Maryland, he said, hmm, that's a good, I was going to grad school, and he said, you should look at University of Maryland. They have a good program in education, for, especially for human development. And in Afro-American studies, you'll meet Dr. Andrew Billingsley and Sharon Harley. They'll be good people for you there. And, um, and you were absolutely right. It was in my last year at Spelman, Professor Billingsley and Joyce Gladden came to do a talk at Spelman. It was so strange because it was going to be in the basement of my dormitory. And I thought, why would they have, a, have these folks come and talk there? And I was running late from a class. And I got there, and Dr. Billingsley was gone. Professor Ladner was speaking. And I said, where's Dr. Billingsley? He said, oh, he had to leave to get a flight. So I ran up the stairs. It's Morehouse James. Remember that? I took off after outside. And I saw this gentleman way in the distance carrying a bag. And I ran over to him. And I was talking a mile a minute. But he would encourage me to introduce myself to him and let him know I was going to be in Maryland and wanted to and ask if there was some way I could work with him. And of course, when I told him that I was a Kai Turner, he brought his greetings. He just smiled. So big. And he says, all right, write everything you just said to me in a letter and send it to me in Maryland. Um, also, it was in Mar a human in Maryland where, um, because of my interest in, in black psychology and black child development, he said, look, Dr. Boykin is right across the, the way at Howard, so you make sure you go and see him and spend time with him, too. And when things got tough in Maryland, of which they did, um, and I couldn't find folks to talk to me about the things that I was interested in, I got on the bus and went to Howard and went up into the building where he was, and there was a line of students waiting to talk to him, just like outside your office. And I thought, well, I'm waiting. i got to wait. i got to talk to this guy. So then later on, my education continued. And when I decided that I wanted to come back here and do the program at Africana, um, I said, so then, you know, I think it would be really good to do. You think this sounds weird? And you said, no. I think you should treat it as a postdoc. You know, and this would be a great opportunity for you now. You can really look at some issues that maybe you didn't get before. You can fill in some gaps. Um, and then you can work on your interest, which was black women and health. And he says, but I think the first thing you have to do, you need to go and make an appointment with Professor Harris. And just sort of as a courtesy, let him know what you're interested in. He was the chair at the time. And that you'd like to do this. And so I did. And then we started talking about who would you work with. And so it was a no-brainer. Um, Professor Andri Asi Lumumba I had met before and was very interested in my, my development and said, yes, I can work with you around women's issues. And then the other person was Professor Edmondson. So I was tickled by this, but I thought, well, Professor Edmondson still sees me because this little kid who ate peanut butter sandwiches at his house. <laughs> well, where we'd be able to move forward. And so Professor Edmondson let me go straight away, like, um, you're a student just like everybody else. And you're going to get the benefit of my advice, just like everybody else. And as we were working on those drafts and those chapters towards the end, we had this thing that kept happening. I mean, Dad had always taught us to write a capital B when we referred to black people. And Professor Edmondson was saying, what are you doing? <laughs> this, is not correct. this is not correct. You know, it doesn't flow. It's, it's a small beat. So we would have these things back and forth. But I always appreciate the fact that he was very honest with me and very open with me. And Professor Asi Lumumba has, you know, not only did she see me through the end of the program, but she stayed with me. So when I left here and went on to North Carolina a and she was right there with her letters of support and constant conversation. So learning orientation was, was, has always been there. It taught us to be lifelong learners. And so um, we, we have tried also to do that. One of the things I wanted to say, too, is that you, you stressed self-confidence with us as well. I wasn't one to explore much or to try out new things, especially when I was younger. But one of the opportunities that came forward in Maryland was to, to go to Ghana. And it was a cultural arts program, and I wanted to go. I applied for it, but then I kind of didn't want to go. I was hesitant because the, everybody was going. I was the only black student that was going. The, the person taking us was white. The other students were white. And I just wasn't sure how that was all going to work out. And so we talked about it. And you said, and I remember you talking to me saying, well, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You will find that you will be even different when you come back. But you should think about it as an opportunity to really become immersed in the culture and get to know the people. And then he said to me, well, you know Professor Adams uh, can tell you all about this. She was in Ghana. She's working in Ghana. So if she can go there and, and create uh, a community and do things that, were, would, would, that she found um, uh, fulfilling, then so can you. And then he reminded me of the fact that we have family in Ghana. And so what else happened was that he wrote all these letters of introduction for me for all these different faculty and people in the community. 
And when I landed and got my bearings, I started going around campus to see who would help me find these individuals who you knew. And some of them were on ca our campus, of, of course, and I would the letter, you send the letter forward, and they'd wait, wait at the door so they'd receive you. And here comes this faculty member, and then he just started saying, James turn. He just looked at me and said that. And then when I um, it was time to leave Ghana, I decided to stay, which surprised everybody. But I stayed for an extra week or two because we found a family that we'd always known. And so these uh, some, family, some friends at the university took me to meet the Cotes. They hadn't seen us since we were kids. And they just said, wait in the car. I'm not sure if this is the right house. Drove up and knocked on the door, and somebody walked in and explained that I was there. And they came out. And they just kept saying, James and Janice, James and Janice, James and Janice. They didn't say my name. They said, Great. So I stayed with them. And that was, that was really, really important. And then finally, self-reliance is something that you instilled in, in me. And it was always very, very important. So according to our research with Dr. Taylor, self-reliance is knowing that there are times when you have to think and act alone. Um, even sometimes when some people are going right, you have to decide to go left when it's appropriate. And there were those moments when it was confusing about what to do. I won't go into detail, but you remember the whole Huckleberry Finn thing, right, there In high school, and how I just didn't know how I was going to get through that. And the teacher wanted me to read out loud, and I was like, I'm not doing that. And then I came home, and I said, what am I going to do? Because they're going to think I was the only black kid in the class. They're going to think I'm trying to get out of it. Like, I don't really want to do that work, but I knew I wasn't going to sit there. These were kids I'd gone to school with since elementary school at Cuba Heights. A lot of them had faculty, dads, and moms. But they were there snickering and laughing like it was a big joke. Mm -hmm. So you came up with the idea, said, no worries, you don't have to do it. But you're not going to get out of it. You still have to have a project. So we had an alternative. And you said, you're going to write about Langston Hughes. And so every day, you go to the library while they do Huckleberry Finn, and you work on your project. Um, and we got through that. So that taught me, too. When we were in Spelman, some people have talked about investment. So Spelman was. We found out that the Spelman was heavy, had some heavy money in South Africa, and um, nobody was talking about it too loudly. But there was a few of us, we were involved in a club called Dudes Against Racism and Apartheid. And we were meeting mostly on Morehouse's campus, it wasn't really okay to do it in Spelman first. And then there was a couple of faculty who were visiting from South Africa, and they sort of took us under their wing and they had meetings. So we could talk about what the issues were. And so we began, the small meetings got larger, and then there was a plan to protest, to do a walkout on campus, and to, to demonstrate in front of the gates. Then there was a rumor that we might get arrested. So I said, oh, who got, where did that come from? So people were getting scared, like they didn't want to do it. So I got on the phone, and I said, hey, Dad, so let me tell you what's happening now. Um, so there's a chance I might get arrested. You're okay with that? And remember, you didn't even laugh. You took it very seriously. You said, you know what? No, we're not worried about that. But what I think you need to do is make sure your message is clear, make sure you and your friends stick together, and get a good night's rest tonight. Don't worry about tomorrow. So we did. So the next day, we were all, uh, and there was an announcement made across campus that we should all come to, uh, to, um, to the president's office. And we didn't know at the time the trustees had already been here. And they asked Marilyn Wright, Marianne Wright Edelman to come in and talk to us. Basically, what they said was that Spelman had decided to do that. And so we were thinking, yeah, we did that. That was us. But I think that, you know, again, that was a part, that was a challenge at first because, you know, some of us were being labeled troublemakers. Why couldn't we just be glad to be chosen to be at Spelman and just get on with our lives? But you talk to us that sometimes you have to go left when everyone else is going right. And then the last. I think experience I want to share. And again, in Spelman too, that was such an interesting time. So I was talking to Professor Jeffries while I was at Spelman and Assam was at Morehouse. Um, his niece was there. Um, Dr. Clark's daughter and Zinga was there. Uh, Max Robinson, who was big time uh, on the news, remember? Back way back, right? His, yeah? LeBron Bennett's son was at Morehouse at the time we were there. So Max Robinson's daughter was there. And also Bill Cosby's daughter was there. So we were, that, oh right, of course, the King, right, we were, it's, it's Bellin Morehouse at the time, the King children were there. So Bernice, or Bunny King, was a couple of years ahead of me. Dexter King. And Dexter was with him. So we were always around people who had different views and different perspectives. But you simply said, who are you? Stay true to what your convictions are and what you need to do. And then when I was at Maryland, and there wasn't anybody on the faculty to talk to about the things that I was interested in in terms of research, we were required to do an internship. 
and we had to do it in some human service organization. And I remember calling you up and saying, Dad, I don't know DC that well. Where do you think I could go? And you said, what about the National Black Child Development Institute? I said, that sounds good. And then you called up Auntie Eleanor, and she made some calls, and the next thing I had an internship. Well, the faculty, they made me happy. I'm fulfilling my responsibilities as a student. Well, it wasn't until it was nearly over, and I was sort of, you know, doing my report, I had a faculty member who said, well, maybe next time you will go work at the National Black White Child Institute. Oh. And I remember thinking, who talks like this? What kind of mess is that? But then I said, you know what? I had a good experience. They offered to hire me, but I had to go back to school. So anyway, these were things that I probably wouldn't have been, do, been able to do comfortably or as easily as it were um, if you hadn't encouraged us to just to do the things that we thought were important and to not always be weighed down by what other people said. So like everybody here, I could go on and on, but I know it's short time is running. So I just want to share those few things with you that I have forgotten. I have a treasure chest full of stuff that's part of our work together, um, and I appreciate you. things that I wanted to say about community here at Ithaca. So it was rough growing up. Um, it, 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 well, I should say, Cuba Heights was great. I got through it, no problem. I got down to Boynton for middle school, and all of a sudden it just hit the fan. I was in a, in a more diverse community, um, and, I, and, and I got into fights, and this one day I just got jumped. And I remember coming back home, and my mom said, what happened? I said, well, I got you know, just jumped in. I can't believe all these white kids, what are they doing down there? I said, well, no, mom, it was all black kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in that moment, she said, what? And I said, yeah, all the kids I just met. So I remember Ms. J, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, everybody from the community came together and said, are you all kidding me? We're all down in the office. She said, you know who all these people are? So they didn't know who I was. Uh, but when, they, when mom and dad came down, uh, all of a sudden they realized, Oh, these are the same people like my sister mentioned that have been helping us in school. And here I am in a fight with them. I mean, I've got a black eye, you know, somebody got something. But it, it, it didn't make any sense. You know, we were, we were not strong in numbers down there. Uh, and but here we were in the principal's office, seven or eight of us strong. You know, and I'm, I guess I'm the outlier. But I remember Miss J coming down, you know, because you know, standing song right behind me, Mr. Ms. Lee, everybody in the community in Southside, the Scott, it, I mean, there was an outpouring of it for us to, to get together and know each other. And after that, that was it. I, it had no other issues. Um, but it was because of that work um, that helped get us to the people. So how'd you get to with it? How'd you survive? <laughs> I had people. I got lots of people. So one last thing I want to share, that, uh, Dad, this is from uh, your other grandchildren, uh, my, my, our daughter, and son Jared and Karen, so who couldn't be here today. And I just want to say thank you, Grandfather, for your life's work, helping to, buy, helping to provide understanding and guidance to us and to so many. We are so blessed that you love us and continue to guide us. We are very proud of you and Grandmother, and we love you very much.
very large extended family network. None of the brothers in that network, um, none of the relationships that I have with those brothers uh, surpasses the kind of engagement that you and I have developed over the years. And it's a very special thing for me, and uh, I'm very thankful for that as well. Our relationship began in 1969, a mutual friend introduced us uh, uh, at Brooklyn College. You were there to, to, to provide a talk. Uh, the relationship, such as it was, continued in 1971 when you came to Virginia State, where I was director of the Center for Black Studies, to uh, help uh, develop an initiative we, were, we had started uh, there. Uh, I moved to Boston in 1973, during the three years that I was there. Our uh, geographical closeness, as well as our growing collaborations in developing black studies, um, brought me even closer to you. And um, from 1976 thereafter, we seem to always uh, visit with one another, intersect in one way or another, wherever I, I live. And that included Boston, that included uh, California, and uh, Washington, D.C., and, uh, and other places in, you know, in Virginia for the last, uh, my being in Virginia for the last 20 years. Um, the way you led your life in the culture of struggle provides us with some tremendous instruction and guidance for how we can carry our lives uh, forward. And I'd like to just um, point to some of the gifts that you have given me and I think you've shared with other people that have helped us in our walk through, through life. Thank you, James, for the gift of your visionary, victorious consciousness. Um, there's a proverb that only when lions have historians will hunters cease to be heroes. Your lion's roar is loud, and it extends far and wide, and has impacted people in still untold ways. You insist that we claim and apply and retain our heritage as a safeguard against the impulse to jump into diversions that take us away from ourselves. Um, that's important. You show us how to navigate an often hostile world while carrying the awesome weight of being a conscious black person. You do this with foresight, farsight, resilience, and a revolutionary patience. <coughs> Secondly, thank you, brother, for your exemplary embrace of a culture of struggle. Checking you out is very motivational. You acknowledge past individual and collective achievements, but I especially thank you for the input you give into looking ahead and the guidance as to how to possibly get there. Thanks for teaching me about resistance and about building alternatives and for encouraging and reinforcing me and us to be change agents in our own behalf. Um, Thank you also for helping us to never forget that we are beautiful and that our struggle has beauty to it as well. I benefit greatly from your ministry to me and to our community. You encourage me as a champion who defends and projects our people with underlying love as a central part of our historical struggle. Thank you so much for this gift. Thank you for your responsible and accountable servant leadership. As a wise mentor and valued teacher and a reliable comrade and a trusted confidant, your impact is felt worldwide. You're a global organizer of black people. And I think that we, we, we lift up the concept of being scholar activists, but I, I think we need to amend that and say that being an organizer of our people for a better life and attempts to claim our humanity is the highest calling that we can take on. Being organizers. So thank you for your, your leadership in those regards. You are in touch with and obedient to your ancestral assignment. And you have shown us how to do that as well. You live out that highest calling, as I said, the legacy of developing leadership among those that you walk with and laying the foundation for that kind of development of people coming behind you is unparalleled. I'm proud to say that I am what other people have labeled, particularly Kimberly Crenshaw, B. 
being a turnaround. How many of y'all are turnarounds in the show? So, uh, turnaround. Proud to, to call that. I was glad to see the label on the bag as well. Um, we uh, thank you, James, for your endurance as a long distance runner, long distance runner that John O'Killens talked about we needed to replicate. We needed so many more of us. Um, in the tradition of Garnett and Tubman and Maria Stewart, Martin Delaney, and Du Bois, and another attorney, Bishop Henry McNeil, uh, Garvey Robinson, and Du Bois, you helped to perpetuate that tra tradition and to prepare others for extending a extending it into the future. That's a unique contribution. My dear brother, thank you for the gift of your moral fortitude. You are consistent and uncompromising in your fearlessness and courageousness. You are a brother who's got some backbone. You, you, your personal integrity is unassailable. Thank you for your moral authority. Another gift or a beacon of light is your generosity, for which I am deeply indebted to you. Thank you, my friend, and thanks to Janice and your family for sharing you with us. Thank you for your availability and the myriad ways you spend yourself. No doubt that expenditure of your time and effort takes a toll, and uh, it's a sacrifice that so many of us have benefited from. By example, brother, you have helped me to ease into the sometimes daunting challenges of elderhood. I'm still studying that. Thank you for the gift. Your practice of intellectual and scholarly tenacity is awesome. That serves to motivate me in untold ways. Your acumen, acumen as a strategic organizer, as a mastermind of black liberation projects, look where we are now. Um, whenever um, I get the chance, I use music to help me draw meaning out of, 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 of life's experiences. And I think about the Lady B. Franklin's uh, song, um, uh, The House That Jack Built. And I want to massage that just 10 seconds. And if we remember, there is part of the song that says, um, uh, I got the house, I got the car, uh, I got the job, but I ain't got Jack. Well, if you replaced the word Jack with James, and if you forget about the car and the job, we got the house, it's come out of ashes. We got the house and we got you. And we're very thankful for that. You are spiritual. You're not religious in the conventional sense, but your spirit speaks volumes in everything you do. Being around you impacts people in all kinds of ways. I know this because of the faith that you embody. The spirit of passion, humility, and commitment are marked by James Turner. Thank you for your spirit. Then there is the gift of love that you offer in abundance through your representation of strong masculine manhood and your powerful platonic eternal bonding. To conclude, I hope Professor Harris hears that. Um, to conclude, uh, I, want, okay. <laughs> I want to just drop four final, lighter kinds of thoughts in ways that I reference you, in ways that I remember you, in ways that I, in ways that I internalize you. First, as others have said so well, you're a music man. It's Kai David out there. She talked about what goes on inside your, 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 your home. Um, you share music together, especially the R&B, vocal harmonic traditions uh, that marked our youth and early adulthood, and um, we have a common interest in that music, and we debate who the best group is and who the best lead singers are, and we agree on a whole lot of that too. The debate is a bunch of fun. But James, you are a jazz man. You're a jazz man in the best sense of tradition of that distinguished art form. You're cool, people have talked about that. Jonathan did that the other day. James uh, Stewart wrote about it in the program bulletin. And I'm here to shout it out as well. Um, you are cool, man. I hear people now 
reducing the power of that description. Oh, that's very cool. No, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's all, that's profound in and of itself. You can modify that. Tim is turning to you, oh cool, you have a sophisticated smoothness about you that does not obscure your earthiness. Uh, Scott Brown and other people might say it doesn't obscure, obscure your funk in the positive mm -hmm. way, of course. Um, um, we, 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 we know that you're an improviser. And of course, that is a distinguishing characteristic of jazz. James Turner, you're the penultimate improviser. You're a jazz man. You did Kenny Doro. You did a whole lot of other people. And people may not know that you have a specialization as kind of a hobby which is to collect the uh, album covers of, uh, of, of, of jazz recordings. And uh, that's a particular interest of yours. Secondly, um, you, I, I think of you as a fashionista. That's an extension of your coolness. Have you all ever checked out Brother Man's shoes? Yeah. And I know you checked out the uh, sartorial splendor that he presents himself in for all kinds of occasions. Uh, maybe even going to bed, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you set, certainly set uh, a, a unique tone and style and variety in what you do as far as clothes are concerned. I think of you as a food connoisseur. I most especially think that um, that may be one of your highest or lowest uh, hedonistic pleasures. <laughs> but if you host James at your house, beware of the midnight creepers. Brother is known famously for his late night refrigerator raid. <laughs> and that could be raid of fading of anything, so particularly any food that was left over for dinner. I'll give you a hint. If you prepare barbecue ribs, look out. If you uh, do desserts, I look out to you, especially like <laughs> eating pies and sweet potato pies. Um, and then this last uh, more lighthearted uh, comment I want to make is that I refer to you um, uh, lovingly and dearly as a um, uh, sometimes disapproving big brother, mm -hmm. an anecdote. Mm -hmm. I am a product of learning how to drive in New York City. Mm -hmm. And with that, I have carried over some habits that may not always be uh, the safest, the most careful. <laughs> James, James, you know what I mean? James is a careful observer of those kinds of driving habits. And on more than one occasion, he has gently suggested that I be a little more cautious. Okay, so I, I take that in. So James comes down to New Orleans to visit, and uh, we're riding along, and I made a change that, that I felt real proud about, you know, and I couldn't wait. Uh, at the appropriate time to let him know that I had slowed down on my, on my driving. And so um, I uh, waited for the special moment and I told him that. And with a slow, stoic, dry, matter of fact manner, he said, You must have had a rematch. <laughs>
brother, you know, to the young people, I mean to the old people and young, father to the young people, he ministered, you know, and he taught the seriousness of how to stay the course, you know, how to think out of the box and all of that, you know. And um, he just he just reached and then the fact was once I got here and all of that, he just um you know, any time I needed to talk to him, you know, just like some of the other people were saying the other day, no matter how many classes he taught, how many staff meetings he had, you know, you, you could just tap on the door, Brother Turner, could I? Yeah, come on in, you know, none of that. Did you make an appointment? You know, so um, he used to just give me access. But I, I also knew how to stay out of the way because he always seemed too important for me to be bothered. <laughs> you know, so I used to try to stay out of the way, but every now and then I had to go and just let him know in so many ways how appreciative I was for how he reached down to get me up here. And out of that came, you know, um, with the things that I watched in him being like a, a general contractor, overseer, you know, delegating things, pulling things together, you know, creating this, that, and the other. That instilled in me in the sense that eventually it gave me the courage to go on and start my own construction company and to start uh, another corporation called the African American Training and Job Development Association, which sometimes I accidentally say Africana, <laughs> thinking in that, you know. But he also was very loving and respect in that, you know, one said that when he said they go to the to the right, you go to the left. I say, when they go, you also show me when you go to the left, I can go to the right. You know, in other words, you don't have to just keep going down the same path everybody else is going. Sometimes you can bring some new ideas to the situation and things of that nature. And as a result of that, to this day, you know, I, I run that training uh, corporation as well as the, the uh, DBA construction company that I ran since 1985 and everything, and also through that process, I also minister over congregation and things. And all of that, when they wonder how you do it, it was all because of the way of watching how Brother Turner popped and jumped all around everywhere and kept everything so organized, you know. And so as a result of that, I've learned how to do that. And, um, and I just can't thank them enough. They blessed me, let me come down every summer. I used to come down. You know, they thought I was coming to work on the house, but I was just coming to spend time <laughs> with them and everything. And, and just spent, you know, years and years and years. And like, I, I did come in 1970. The children was just on the way and everything. I remember that house also on the hill in the grass, you know, behind it. When it became once a tennis court, and now we've got the statue out there. was up in the grass and everything. So I remember all those days. Brother Turner, you know, goes without saying, love you and thank you so much for what you've done. You know, I could have never gotten to where I was going. Didn't reach down, <laughs> pull a little man up out of nothing. You know? <laughs> Yeah. 
I mean, the university had already allocated funding for the Africana Research, uh, Africana Studies and Research Center, even before the allocation. But there is no doubt, no doubt, that the traumatic event, incidents of April 6, 1969, and the complex, often difficult discussions at the time, accelerated the pace of change. Changes that would ultimately make Cornell far more inclusive and its campus climate and its academic life. The establishment of the Africana Studies and Research Center and its development on Professor James Turner put Cornell in vanguard of universities and colleges in recognizing the validity and comprehensiveness of the African diaspora. As founding director, Professor Turner inspired our others, as we saw today with his vision for a program that, that went beyond narrow definition of black studies. Through multiple lenses of history, politics, philosophy, literature, and more, actually when I was on the faculty at Penn State, there was an Africana Research Center there, which was inspired by Africana Studies and Research Center. And I participated in some of those activities, and I'm an immunologist, not a humanist. So many fields, Take advantage, or taking advantage of the study of Africana studies. The Africana Studies and Research Center focused research and teaching on the diverse perspectives of diverse peoples from the African and the diaspora, bringing to light experiences and contributions that had previously received little scholarly attention. This at a time when academia was overwhelmingly, as it is, white and Eurocentric. And the focus of its studies and the composition of its faculty, administration, and students. We have more to do in terms of achieving, achieving a fully inclusive climate. But we have made progress. And Professor James Turner and the African Studies and Research Center are important to that story of progress. In the years since the center was founded, success encouraged the proliferation of a range of interdisciplinary programs at Cornell and across the country including programs focused on women, LGBTQ people, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Cornell University is proud to be the home of Africana Studies and Research Center, proud of its scholarship and its students and graduates. Professor Turner, all respect to you. We salute you for your vision, your leadership, and your deep dedication to Africana Studies. You've helped change Cornell and American higher education for the better. Thank you. Alone, 
you know that the Cornell Black Alumni Association considers Dr. Turner and Dean Turner a treasure. And so over the years, we have had a number of different programs to celebrate and to honor them. In 2012, on the, um, when they decided that they were going to retire on us, we started a scholarship fund in their name. We raise funds for that every year. So when you see something coming out about Alvin Ailey and donating, is to raise money for the Dr. James and Janice Turner Scholarship Fund. In, where's Marcus? Marcus just left. In 2016, on an anniversary of um, Ujama, um, we wanted to recognize both of them again, and we wanted to name a space in, um, and I don't know how many of you were here for that homecoming weekend. We wanted to name a space, the main lounge in Uj after um, the tournament, and we were told that we had to raise $100,000 in order to get that space named after the tournament. But we had a recognition ceremony that day, and there are a group of us who are trying to put plans in place to recognize with a space on this campus as well as just yesterday, today, someone was saying we need to do something more powerful. Something needs to happen in this space and perhaps we should look at um, trying to start an endowed chair. So don't sleep on SIBA. We are going to be doing more to honor their legacy. And during the last two days while you, I was sitting over in the corner with my laptop. I'm a person, I didn't realize I was, a, I was a visual learner, but the way I tell a story a lot of times is through pictures. And so while people were talking, I was trying to find pictures on my computer, which was giving me a hard time. And I wanted to share them with you very quickly. So just bear with me. So. Oh. So, Dr. Turner, you impacted thousands of students over the course of your career at Cornell, and this was one of them. I came here with others in 1984 thinking I was going to change the world. I had always wanted to be a teacher, but everybody told me I was too smart to be a teacher, that um, I was going to get burned out, and so I came here to to go into law. I sat in your class and Dr. Cross's class, and I realized everybody wanted to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, or a vet. And I said, if everybody's doing that, who's going to teach them? And guess what? You and Dr. Cross said, you. You've got to pay it for it. You've got to give back to the community. Thanks to you, I'm 30 years in education. Everybody talked about the readings. Dr. Turner gave us many, many, many readings. But I have to thank you because the scholarship, the, you opened our minds. You instilled a sense, and I hope I'm not going to cry, but a sense of pride in us. You told us that life did not begin on those slave ships, that they began back in ancient Africa. You exposed us to people like Dr. Ben. You know, who took some of us to Egypt and showed us, look at your history. You walking around with your pants hanging down and doing things that disrespect our history and our culture. And when we look at those pyramids that were still standing, I can't tell you the sense of pride that I had going there and walking in those pyramids. Thank you for bringing us Dr. Ben. You even introduced us to Dr. Karanga, and we learned about Kwanzaa that was started the, the year that, that, that some of us were born. And here I am still teaching others about the cultural values that we have to instill in our children and in our community. Thank you. You brought us Dr. Clark. That sister that said you sat at his feet, Dr. Clark used to, and Dr. Ben, like they will come on that little putt-putt plane um, in the airport just to speak.
speak to students and gave us of their time and their knowledge, and for that, we are grateful. You were always there, not just at Cornell. So now I'm just going to show you some quick pictures. Every time I pop up at an event in the city, who do I see in the audience? Dr. Turner. How many city people can attest to that? Right? Walking through, um, where was it, two years ago, Memorial Day weekend, was it BAM? You and, and, and Dean Turner were coming to see a show, and you would have thought the president, not this one, was in town because there was this crowd of people that were following this man like he was a god. That god was Dr. Turner. Oh. Dr. Je you brought us Dr. Jeffries. I could remember State of Black America, Anthony, Jackie, uh, before we graduated. You brought us Ron Dellums, Barbara Sizemore, all of the foremost thinkers in Africana studies. Thank you. You supported us in our efforts. This was a taping um, in Africana in New York in uh, 2011. You, Dr. Harris, um, Professor Nanji, all of you were just dropping knowledge. And who taped it? I think um, Anika and, and and Jabari. So some of your some of your 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 stories, your knowledge, your history, we have to capture more of it. Oh, and Professor Lumumba, you were there as well. And we had a number of alumni that were there in the audience. For this, Dean Turner and Dr. Turner, I say thank you. This is my daughter who had no intention of applying to Cornell until she sat, Dr. Turner, in your office both of you had retired. I had left the message not realizing you had retired um, and called, called both of your offices and said, I'm bringing my daughter up. I want her to see Cornell. You both went out of your way to make it here. I don't know, it was a Friday, Saturday night, 6 o'clock in your office here in Africana. You and the, the, the chapter of, of my, my stories of Deltas sat here and talked to my daughter about Cornell. All I had to do was sit back and let the two of you and the Deltas do your magic. My daughter applied early decision, got in, has now graduated from Cornell and is a third year PhD student at Vanderbilt studying, guess what, black girls and identity because she has used Dr. Cross's work on black identity. Thank you. We ran into Dr. Cross a few years ago. These are just pictures of a number of different events that we have had. Seba has tried every time there's a homecoming every year to do something to recognize Dr. Turner because he is always there. Remember commemor the commemoration? You didn't want to speak? Seba members were like, where's Dr. Turner and why is not he Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm just going to keep playing the pictures, but the next person can come up. Thank you. Center 
1975. So some of the things I've heard have been so incredible, but the early classes helped to clear the brush out of the way. Right. So, so we love you, and I worked for years as a dean with Janice Turner, and so uh, so many of you have graduated without James and Janice and my and my children also. Sakai and Shaka and Hassan, who were like family. I had to crack on Hassan today. They called me Uncle Larry in the public, but I knew that privately they called me Uncle Waldo. <laughs> so I know that you all have been sitting a long time. This is a gigantic task. I'm going to be very brief. I've had, when I left the authority of Dr. Turner and the other faculty here at, the, um, at, uh, at uh, Cornell, at the African Studies Research Center, I did my work with Professor Harris on Joel Augustus Rogers. It was a difficult process. I left here and I uh, went on to be a dean at Cornell and then I left to go to Harvard where I trained by Dr. Turner, hooked up with the late Derek Bell and my dear best friend, Charles Ogletree. And so the tradition for all of us continues in terms of the work that we do. So I'm going to do Something, I had something else planned, but I'm going to change it because that's what the conversation is about. I hope we can get a microphone that works, please. And I'm going to do something I did for Nelson Mandela because I think it's appropriate for me to do it for Dr. James Turner because he's cut of the same cloth. And so it's something that you will recognize. One of the things about Dr. Turner that made all the difference, uh, only one of can help. No. Is that no. Dr. Turner, that's what I do off the open air. It's happened before. Um, one of the things about Dr. Turner is he integrated and didn't allow the uh, theorist to overtake the practitioners. And I've tried to live my life in that spirit because it takes all of us. So I've been a professor at Berkeley College of Music for 24 years. Uh, and uh, have students in the spirit of Dr. Turner all over the world that really know the foundation of who we are as a people. This is a song you recognize, uh, and I hope I can get somebody to cross this piece All right, that's the best you can do. But you can do. So we're at living. This is like a college lecture. We'll do this real quick. Hey, can somebody turn this on because I put it here? Can we do this? Because I need to see the, the track on the. Um, and I wasn't going to miss this event because Dr. Turner has been very dear to me. Uh, I had some wonderful stories I would like to have told about his coolness, uh, as opposed to some other people that he worked with. But I won't do that. Uh, I'll just say that. Uh, that's the mic. That mic works. That mic works. Okay. Can we, can we get the desktop to come on, possibly? Or oh, I'll just change up completely. Can somebody get the desktop to come on? This is what, this is what, no, this is not going to work. I'm just going to do this. This is what happens when we come out of the traditional, traditional black church, those of us who came out of the church. So we know that, that uh, the sincerity is what counts. I know you've all been sitting a very long time. It comes a really challenge. You know, for all about, uh, when I was uh, being at the President Berkman, Charles Ogletree had me as a resident artist at the Harvard Law School after I had left Harvard under bad circumstances. And before every show, or before every speaker, whether it be Desmond Tutu or a member of the Supreme Court, he'd have me to sing in the same way Reverend Franklin loved that Aretha Franklin before Dr. King spoke. And so we always in our programs have to have the cultural expression and music to circumscribe this whole thing. And therefore, since it's not about me, and then ultimately it's not about Dr. Turner, it's about the collectivity. We're going to do this in the spirit that the words were written because this is what Dr. Turner stood for. So, do you see that on there? So if you, if you turn the volume up and hit that, I'm not going to tell y'all what it is, but I want you to stand. If we do get it up, can you? <laughs> we, oh, I see something. So it's going to take a moment. So while that moment is coming, could you all please stand and stretch? Yeah. Now, thank God, I don't have any performances tomorrow, because after this one, 
Um, there will be no place left because we're not going to use those mics that make it work. And so we go, this is what you call flat foot singing. This is when we go from the bottom of our foot and we do it. So while they get that hooked up, since Dr. Tun is such a, a jazz aficionado, I'm going to do a little piece of acapella into this song. That's something he may remember. Trying times is what the world is talking about. You got confusion all over the land. Mother against daughter, father against son. The whole thing is getting out of hand. But folks wouldn't have to suffer if there was one You got the riots and the girls. They're all around. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> A whole lot of things that's going wrong. That's going down. <laughs> I do understand it, my point of view. I remember people said to one another, I'm going to do what has to do with you. <laughs> but folks wouldn't have to suffer if there was more love. Thank you.
87 yesterday. my turn of family, so I brought my mom with me. Aww. So I want to have tell all of you, and especially, especially the turn of children, and all of you, with all of me, rather than degree, by the way, I don't have a doctorate degree, but when I do break up, they said, that's okay, you got one of our books. Mm -hmm. I want you to clear it up, because the other day I made up that error, when y'all were having folks at Stanford, and you said, congratulate me for the uh, African faculty. And then I thought when they said, the grad, I didn't hear the grad faculty. I just heard grads, I'm so excited. But I was part of Africana, I stood up. But my elder, my elder Randy, he said, I saw you stand up. He <laughs> said, grad faculty. I apologize. I'll uh, never forget family and love. And this is a family. And I'm so glad tonight that I can bring my family and join this family and meet some of James's sisters to let y'all know that everything this man has stood for and this woman has been loved. Thank you very much.
Um, I'm happy to announce that we have a proclamation from Mayor Savante Myrick making today, April 13, 2019, James Turner Day. <laughs> So there's an ideogram, we have used it 
We use sand for, for Professor Edison, and here we did something for Professor Masri. And uh, so this one is for Professor Turner. And we tried to select a few that capture a few dimensions of your rich and complex knowledge system. And we contacted uh, several of you, we tried to contact everybody uh, to send a few words, three to four words. I remember Professor Harris spoke, you mean really four words? <laughs> and others don't, didn't even ask the question, they sent the whole, the whole uh, writing. And uh, then we had to struggle to find two, three words. So that's what we have done since we're going to have a book out of this uh, conference, we will have a space for more work. So if you didn't have a chance to send your work on time and it's not on this plaque, don't despair. It will be in the book. So uh, can you come so that uh, we present it uh, to Professor Tan? So, so this has the names of the people who made the statement. But on the plaque itself, we have just the word. So if you want to find out who said what, you have to consult this list. Okay. So,
you have to encourage them, and I hope that they take encouragement from our experience this weekend, that biography is sometimes the best source and reference point in what some call biography as data. Also, I think we set a model for encouraging those of us who have feel as expressed during the conference, feel that there is no or very little reason to have hope for where we are. And some others of our colleagues responded that despair is not really going to move us in a progressive manner. But we must find ways to help each other remain fit and protected. As you get older, the more important you recognize is your ability to control things happening around you, to you, in your body, and on your body. Finding out that more and more these long term health issues can stymie your production. So to think about who and how you can work with. and fashion positive, caring, and loving relations with them. You know, I'm quite serious about that. Try to plan to do things with people whom you enjoy spending time with, with whom you have common core, feel good about and use it. We must not be so busy that we cannot allow ourselves to enjoy, enjoy the things that help us sing and dance. You know the you heard a couple of references in these letters to Wednesday night. <laughs> I wish we could have had somebody not to be able to talk about. But really, what people are really talking about is how they enjoy themselves in various parts of the African studies and research center. And uh, to that effect, Wednesday night was a special glorious moment for two hours or so where we opened up the lounge downstairs, put music on, and just hung out, literally. And it was such that people came from other, all parts of the campus where are you going? I'm going to Wednesday nights. <laughs> I mean, do you all remember that? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes when you're 11, you can smile enough. That sister or brother that you were angry with comes out of you to sustain just your anger. So 
think about how you can treat yourself and treat others, even away from our immediate community. For example, Charles Ogletree, as some of you know, is fighting for long-term debilitating illness. And I don't think he's much older.
about his name was Frederick. And he said to me, anybody else, if there is no start, there is no start. Those who profess the faith of freedom yet deprecate agitation are men and we can women. We want the trumps without power after men. They want the rain without the thunder light. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, it may be a political one, but it must be a struggle. Find out what names people will probably submit to and you found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon that. And this will continue until they resist with either words or blows or both. The limits of time are prescribed by the endurance of those who accept that oppression. We have not accepted it. That's our issue, our struggle. And what about rebirth and resurrection? And that's what this is. This is the seeds of resurrection that we planted for these young babies. That's the most beautiful thing of our time. He's still young, young spirit. So it's about resurrection and rebirth. That's a part of our culture. Death means not the end, but it means that there's a possibility of rebirth and resurrection. And that's what the term has demonstrated to us. And that's what the Sabbath kind of Sabbath has demonstrated to us. No matter what they throw at us, we're ready to deal with it. I, as my wife, have been an example of the biggest attack in the history of the modern world against a lovely little quiet professor in City College. And they do it, I said, bring it on. We're ready for you. And that that's what this is all about. I really want to thank everybody, and particularly Dr. Turner, to reach down inside and say, I'm still here, y'all. Mm -hmm. I left the message. I told you what to do. I got my babies to demonstrate you can do it no matter what. Struggle continues. Now, I hate to do this, but we've been married 50 some years. If she gets a hold, of these instruments, the African Holy Ghost is going to take off and take us. But I couldn't go home without her saying a few words. <laughs> when you've been together for 54 oh, uh, years, and she began the march, she went to Africa first in 1960. I was actually with her in 61. And then the African Holy Ghost moved us around. We got married in 64. And uh, with all the stuff that I've done, like James, if James didn't have this beautiful queen mother, mm -hmm. look at her sitting there so quiet. I think it's <laughs> so strange to carry this brother because he's given so much. That's why the African tradition is family. It's families, queen mothers. It, it's the elders. It's the children. It's even those people who are not even blood, but they're family. And that's what this has been about. I am so glad to be here at this time. I said, wow. Now, let's let the queen mother just send us home. You, you, you say right here, yes, I have a, a little a time, but uh, I just want to say that we are a holy people, and we are a blessed people. We are people who have believed in resurrection, so that the storms and the winds may blow, and at times you think we are dead and gone, but we rise again every spring. In fact, in season or out of season, we continue on because it's like a wave of humanity and we are caught up in that wave. Sometimes it's like a whirlwind and sometimes it's like a sweet, balmy breeze and we're thankful for all of that. Uh, I am particularly thankful for uh, 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 Dr. James Turner back in the 1980s. I had a major exhibition at Cornell University through the art department. My PhD was at Yale University in the history of art department. I got a job right after my PhD working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so I worked with the treasures of ancient Nigeria, first class objects and things from Africa and African American history. And these things have been a part of my life, so that in struggling with the activists, et cetera, I have been working with the art objects. The exhibition that James helped me to put up at Cornell University was called Dimensions in African-American Art. 
and it showed you the non-objective artists that believed in the beauty and the holiness of sight, sound, and sensitivities. And at the same time, the exhibition had some things that was rough and wild by activists in the mood of the 1960s. And so that I can say that through it all, the entire family of James Turner, we can always say through it all, through it all, we have learned the struggle and learned patience and how to project ourselves in the generations to come. Generation after generations, we are a holy people. Yeah.